On today's episode of Circles Off, we are joined by one third of the Always Betting podcast. Great podcast. You should check it out. Pisky joins us here. And we're going to get through a lot of topics, including all of his time as a professional sports better, how he got to the level where he did, how his edge eroded, tons of great stuff coming up in this interview. Be sure to tune in for the entire thing. And again, if you like the content, smash that like button, hit that subscribe button. Circles Off, episode 83, starting now. Welcome to Circles Off, here on the Hammer Betting Network, episode number 83. Matizola, joined by Johnny from Betstamp, number 83. There's a lot of them, and I know that Joey Kanish specifically requested that we spend more time naming all the players who wore 83 as he finds it to be the most fascinating segment that we do here on Circles Off. So I think he said minimum 20 minutes, right? I, I think he said he wants at least 20 minutes. Yeah. So what I will do is I will now go through every single professional sport, and I'm even going to go through the minor leagues as well, as I think it's important to pay homage. Yeah, they, they help build what it is, right? Like they build it to the point that it's at. And you hear these crazy stories about guys, why they have certain numbers and change to certain numbers. You know, maybe a guy went through the minors, he wore 83 and then couldn't wear it in the pros. Like Maybe there's a specific story to why they wore that 83. We'll get into that as well. I think it's important to not only the players that wore the numbers, but why they chose it. Uh, in fact, I think we might do an entire episode at some point in the future, <laughs> just about why players chose their numbers. Which That's what I, episode number 100 is. Yeah, it's gonna, it will be riveting content for sure. Uh, but number 83, obviously Wes Welker comes to mind. Vincent Jackson, may he rest in peace. Uh, V-Jax was part of my fantasy squads for years. Heath Miller, my buddy's a Steelers fan. I'll never forget Heath Miller. Lee Evans, who I have a bone to pick with Lee Evans because in 2012, he dropped the ball in the uh, conference championship game. Ravens and Patriots in the end zone. Patriots go on to the Super Bowl. Ugh, God, would have enjoyed anyone but the Patriots. A couple NHLers, Alish Hemsky, and a current NHLer, Jay Beagle, who's been on the block for a long time, Arizona Coyote right now. But uh, Hemsky, you got to explain what happened with Hemsky, why that's the... Alish Hemsky, that was... You're, you're talking about the empty net goal. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> ah, we we got to get the clip in the, uh, in the YouTube... Okay. Uh, comments or not in the in the description below yeah. uh yeah the most one of the most infamous or just famous plays i guess in the history of the nhl was a missed empty netter uh where a player tried to walk who tried to walk it into the net uh it was on dallas mm -hmm. um let's see if i can find it ah. I can't remember off the top of my someone head. tried to walk it into the net and uh boom puck went back the other way we'll get that below but uh, in all seriousness, we're not going to spend the entire episode on this. This has been enough. I'm already sick of the I do got to say, though, I did just get probably the best follow on Twitter of my time on Twitter so far. And that is? The real deal. Oh, the real deal. About, Rob Pizzola Sr. About 10 minutes ago. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. it's. I mean, that's a highlight of your of your life. Yeah. Uh, yes, Rob Pizzola Sr. is on Twitter. Patrick Stefan. Patrick Stefan, yes. Missed the empty netter. Missed the empty netter. We have a very special guest on this week's episode of Circles Off. And as always, Circles Off is presented by Pinnacle Sportsbook. Pinnacle is the sharpest sportsbook in the world and is now available in Ontario. Find out what professional bettors have known for decades. Pinnacle is where the best bettors play. You must be 19 plus in Ontario in order to play. Please re play responsibly. Not available in the United States. We now welcome in our guest for this week on Circles Off. He is a part of the Always Betting Podcast, which you can find on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can check out his website, banfieldgroup.com. You can also follow him on social media, at Banfield Group, on TikTok, Instagram, and on Twitter. We are now joined by Pisky of the Banfield Group. Pisky, how's it going? How's it going, boys? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem at all. We've wanted to have you on for a while, and... Uh, I follow, like, honestly, I think seven people on TikTok. Banfield Group is one of them. I find some of the videos hysterical. Um, I was watching a few this morning and was having a good laugh. But for people out there who haven't followed you, don't know much about you, let's get a personal background on who you are and how you got involved in the betting space. 
Okay, sweet. Um, well, I'll tell my personal story first, and then I'll tell you guys how Banfield Group got started. So I got into the betting space in 2003. Uh, I was growing up, young punk in my hometown, just outside Montreal, and the full dog and I, the full dog's my partner, we were looking for summer jobs, and one of our buddies put us onto this place on the Native Reserve next to where we grew up and said, I don't know, there's some sort of a new sports place that has opened up, and they're looking for clerks to answer phones. So we're like, all right, you know, we're into sports, so uh, yeah, let's check it out. So we ended up going to check it out, and wasn't it an offshore sports book at US? And... Uh, we ended up applying there and getting the job and then immediately falling in love with the industry because, again, we were big sports guys and just, you know, how the money was involved and, uh, you know, taking people's bets over the phone. It was like a super, super cool gig. And then about, I, I think I worked there for three years and it kind of felt like a dead end job. I, I felt like it wasn't progressing the way I wanted to. And again, it's an offshore sports book, so it wasn't like the prim and proper of organizations. Like there was a lot of roughness to it. Uh, so I decided to move on. I decided to go back to school. I moved on to Belleville, Ontario. I went to Loyalist College for a two year kind of sports management program. The full dog, he stayed with BetUS and BetUS ended up moving back down to Costa Rica. So they moved from Costa Rica to the native reserve, Ganawage, just outside Montreal, and then ended up moving back to Costa Rica. So that's how he ended up Costa Rica. And uh, he's still there to this very day. So I went on to Belleville two years. And at the end of my stint at Loyalist, upon graduation, my goal was to work for a hockey team. Mm -hmm. I knew I loved numbers and I knew I loved sports. So I literally applied to every hockey team on the planet. I'm talking, obviously, NHL, AHL. Canadian Hockey League. I went as far as the Swedish elite. I even applied to the KHL because again, <laughs> I was young and full of piss and vinegar and ready to go wherever the wind would take me. I, I, I wanted to do this and uh, I got a ton of failure, right? I, I got rejected everywhere. I basically applied. Um, I'll give a shout out to the coach in Gatineau at the time was Benoit Gru. I don't know if you guys know, he, he worked with Team Canada a little bit. I think he coached the World Juniors. And I remember him reaching out and saying, uh, Alex, that's my real name. Uh, <laughs> Alex, um, you're doing the right thing. The hockey industry is the toughest industry to get into. Uh, but once you're in, you're in for life. Mm -hmm. So that gave me encouragement and I continued applying. And then I, I got a maybe from the San Antonio Rampage down in the AHL. They were the affiliate of the Phoenix Coyotes at the time. And so that, that encouraged me. I was back and forth with their head coach. I forget his name, uh, but very nice gentleman who's from Orangeville, Ontario. And at the same time, you know, I was doing things on the side where I was applying to different things. And that's where the job with the Ontario Lottery Corporation popped up. It was a sports betting analyst job. And I remember reading through the job description and saying, you know what, Fuck, I've done this before. This is bet us all over again, right? So I applied there. And ended up getting called to Toronto for an interview. And I remember that interview. I hit it out of the park. I'm not trying to toot my own horn here. But the reason why I hit it out of the park was because sports, like legit sports betting experience at that time, this is 2008, was unheard of. Right. And I worked for a legitimate sports book. So I knew how odds moved and lines, you know, different types of wagers and stuff like that. So the people interviewing me, shout out to the Godfather. He's one of the guys on our podcast. He, uh, he was blown away, and um, a couple of weeks later, they offered me the job, uh, but I wasn't satisfied. I said, no, my goal is to work in hockey, so I reached back out to the coach at the San Antonio Rampage, and I said, listen, uh, I got offered this job at the Ontario Lottery Corporation, but I am willing to give that up, and I'm even willing to come down to San Antonio and work voluntarily just to prove myself. So he responded and said, you know what, Alex, I've been trying to get a you know, a thumbs up from management up in Phoenix, but, you know, I'm sure you're well aware of the financial situation here. I can't give you a yes or no. So my advice to you would be, you know, take the lottery corporation job and, you know, hockey's not going anywhere. So stay in touch and you never know, you know, down the road at some point. So obviously I, I had to make that move and uh, I ended up taking the job at the lottery corporation and working there 
for 13 years to the day. I, I, I started working September 1st, 2008, and I left September 1st, 2021. Um, so during that, I'll go into my Banfield story now, the Banfield group, how it all started out. So the full dog and I, when we were working at sports books, for anyone out there that has worked at a sports book before, you know that there's a lot of downtime, especially in the dog days of summer. Um, there's a, a ton of time that we were always looking to start a side hustle. And we tried many different things. They failed miserably. And then one day, again, this is later on when I'm at the Lottery Corp, uh, I remember discovering this website called Betfair. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I would do is basically play the odds. You know, I was staring at the Don Best screen all day long at the Lottery Corporation. So I would basically take a look and create arbitrage opportunities for myself where I would guarantee myself one dollar, one single Canadian dollar on uh, NBA games. It's like 20 cents US. Basically. <laughs> basically, yeah, yeah. It was, But you know what? The way I looked at it, I said, Christ, if I can do this and make an extra 20 bucks a week, that pays my Tim Hortons coffees for the week. And uh, <laughs> yeah, like, hey, why not? Right. I'm not doing anything else. Might as well. Because at the Lottery Corporation, I had a very like... Uh, lenient schedule where we, we did four days off, four days on. We worked 12 hour shifts. So four days consecutively off completely. So, you know, what am I going to do? And anyways, that's what I decided to do. So I remember calling my buddy, the full dog down in Costa Rica. And I said, dude, I, I'm doing this new thing at Betfair or whatever. And I told him I was guaranteeing myself a buck a game. And he laughed at me. He laughed hysterically. He's like, what are you doing? Dude, you're wasting your time. And I said, no, I love it. It's free money. Right. Well, doesn't he call me a couple of weeks later and he's like, there's a local guy down here is a website. Uh, here's the login and he's, he's shading some of his games. So maybe you can do some of your arbitrage stuff with him. And I was able to, right. There was uh, money line opportunities in baseball. He was using, I think 10 cent lines at the time. And uh, I would match with pinnacle and basically, yeah, just middle myself all day long. Right. right. And then I progressed into uh, uh, point spreads. And uh, I started getting myself, you know, two, three point middles between this guy down in Costa Rica and again, Pinnacle Sports. And uh, the thing with the Banfield group, everything that we start out of the gate is completely horseshit. Like it fails so bad. And I always say that it is the gods above that are testing us, right? Testing our balls. So this was no different. This started out miserably. I couldn't hit a middle if my life depended on it. There was bad beats across the board. And obviously your confidence starts to waver and you're like, you know, should I be doing this? Is there anything here? And then there was that late night game. I'll never forget it. It was a USC college football game. Look at, and look at, they, look at he's wearing a hey! USC shirt. Like we didn't even know this beforehand. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's crazy. Yeah. Yes. It Let was a guess. USC they, game. They blew it late, right? For the middle? Kind of. Okay. Yes. So they scored with basically no time left in the game. And I think I had eight and a half to 10 and a half, right? So that number 10 is pretty significant. So they, they scored to go up 10 and I'm like, fuck, I'm going to lose by another hook, right? They're going to kick the extra point and win by 11. Well, they missed the extra point. So it landed 10 and fuck it. Finally, finally, it finally happened. We hit a middle. And then it was pure carnage after, I think the next week we hit like four or five. And to the point where we beat the, Bookie down in Costa Rica, down into oblivion, and Banfield Group was born, right? Uh, there was another group that uh, we were very close contact with, shout out to our, our boy Scotty down in Costa Rica. His group was doing live betting, and he said, there's a lot of opportunity there. You guys should take a look, and man, oh man, th those were the glory days, because I remember looking at a place like 888 Sport. They were terrible, and I could literally get... 10 point middles between 888 and pinnacle right uh, you know back in the day and, and this was weird shit i don't think it was the nba you know knowing uh you know the the markets it was probably like korean basketball or something but i didn't care you know hey money's money middle's a middle right so that's it that's how banfield group started and uh from that day forward this was always a thing like we middled and arbitraged probably for the next four years and it was extremely profitable and it kind of the operation has kind of evolved since then 
And here we are today, 2023. I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. I've been here since uh, the middle of August, or sorry, probably the beginning of September. And uh, yeah, still going after it. So prior to your first gig, um, you said you're a clerk at, at BetUS, uh, Kahnawake. I, I know that that office, by the way, very well from my consulting days as well. I think that's where every sports offshore sports book was at some point that was operating mm-hmm. in Canada. But mm-hmm. um, prior to that, like, did, did you have any extensive gambling knowledge before that? Were you a better before joining that? Or was it just one of those things where like, hey, I'm young. This seems like a very interesting job. I'm passionate about sports. Like basically, where did that foundation for sports betting start for you? Well, it started at a super young age for me. I, growing up in Quebec, there was this thing called mise au jeu. That is the equivalent of pro line in Ontario. And my dad and one of his good buddies used to play uh, mise au jeu hockey every Saturday night. I remember they used to put their pending tickets on the TV for good luck and they'd cheer in the Habs and whoever else they had in their parlays. And I was allowed to play it. It's crazy because back then there was no rules. I'd go to the local convenience store as a nine-year-old and they'd sell me parlay tickets, which is bananas in today's day and age. But I remember my dad would let me play one dollar. I guess this is the magical number, the one dollar thing. Uh, he would let me play one dollar parlays. And so I would join them on Saturday nights to watch the hockey games and bet my parlays. And I remember there was this moment. Uh, I put this out on TikTok on Mother's Day because I'll never forget this. My mom still laughs about it today. But basically what I would do, and I guess this is getting into the industry at a very young age and looking for edges, but the Montreal Gazette had uh, basically their columnists that would put out their Sunday picks for NFL football on a weekly basis. I think it came out maybe every Thursday or something like that. And if they had a consensus pick across the board, I would take that and put it into my mise au jeu parlay. And then I saw, I remember seeing a, uh, an ad for, I don't know who that was, some tout out in Vegas. And it said, call now for your free guaranteed winning pick. So <laughs> here I am, literally nine years old. I called the toll-free number and immediately they asked for a credit card number, right? But I'm like a little kid. I'm like, okay, well, that's not going to work. So I hung up. Well, they must have been ahead of the times because they had caller display. So they called back my house. And my mom picked up and they're saying like, this is so-and-so from Las Vegas consultants. Uh, you called us for our free pick of the day. And she's like, no. She goes like, my husband watches sports and my kid loves sports, but I don't think anyone call you. She, and they're like, well, ma'am, someone called. We, can, we have your number on file. She goes, well, it can't be my son. Like he's literally nine years old. And uh, she said, they say, well, man, this is a service for 21 and older. And she's like, well, I, I don't know what to tell you, but no one's buying anything here. So she confronted me about it. Said, Did you call someone for like some sports betting picks or something? I'm like, yeah, but listen, they, they asked for a credit card and I hung up immediately. So there's no charge. And she just kind of rolled her eyes, didn't really understand it. And uh, that was that. So that's how I thought I could uh, you know, build my parlays is take the consensus picks and the free one from Vegas. But obviously, that's no strategy for anyone. And uh, so that's kind of where it all started. And then, uh, yeah, when this place moved to, to Ganawage, it was like it was it was a dream job, essentially. And uh, I, I remember getting involved. And it was funny because the first test to get in the door at BetUS was they handed you four sheets of paper and it had all the cities of all the four major sports. And you had to fill out the monikers. Mm. And I did them all, and I, I actually got one wrong. I couldn't think of one. The Houston Texans. I'll never forget that. I don't know why. Just completely slipped my mind. But uh, yeah, it was pretty interesting that that was your first quiz at, at a new job. Because you know, when you think jobs, you think hard labor. And this was like, wow, sports betting. For sure. Uh, it's funny. I mean, you're only nine years old, so I'm not going to hold you to that. But I think a lot of uh, betters now that are successful, everyone kind of has, I don't want to say everyone to each their own, but a lot of people have like that story from their youth where they're like, I can't believe how much of an idiot I was to like have called a Vegas hotline. For me, <laughs> I used to have uh, AOL dial up internet like we all did mm-hmm. like in mm-hmm. our youth. I had 10 hours a month which I could spend on in, on the internet. That was the packages at that time. You didn't have unlimited internet access. I probably spent eight of those 10 hours every single month on a website that was free plays or freepicks.com or something like that. <laughs> and I'd go through every single tote to get the free play. 
And I thought that these were golden. Like, and I yeah. used to go bet these myself. And then you very quickly realize after, you know, a couple months that no, these aren't, aren't gold. But that, that was how I spent my youth thinking yeah. that there was people on the internet just giving away, you know, the, the goods for free. <laughs> for sure. For sure. We all fall for it. Of course. So let's get into the, uh, the good stuff now. So obviously, you know, that's how you came up. You mentioned calling up your buddy, the full dog, and then starting the Banfield group. So when did you guys start actually winning some serious money and then trying to scale that? And then obviously, you know, leading into eventually you quitting your job last year, which congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So it really started in 2011 with, again, the middling and arbitrage opportunity. We were so conservative and we still are. We are very conservative. Uh, we're betting, you know, our bankroll has increased significantly over the years, but we're betting a micro fraction, fraction of, you know, what the pile is. And that was the thing, you know, we love that there was no risk involved, right? You, okay. So when you're middling, obviously, you know, you're, you're taking from Peter to pay Paul if you lose and you're, you know, subtracting the juice, yep. but arbitrage and middling, you know, I, I recommend that for a lot of beginner beginners because it's it's risk-free and you learn so much about the industry so as the years progressed and those middling opportunities started to dry up a little bit well actually the problem that we were having again learning experience we started to learn the difference between a sharp sports book and a recreational or shit sports book right (laughs) we could not for the life of us keep a balance at pinnacle and the bet three, six, fives and the William Hills and the Stan James of the world, we were kicking their ass. And then obviously we found out this thing where if you kick ass too much in sports betting, well, see you later. They kick you out. Right. So that was that was a new thing. And that was, you know, a, a thing, a, an issue that sunk a lot of other groups that knew what we were doing and they were doing it themselves and making good money. But they got too frustrated when sports books would kick them out. They're like, this is not fair. This is an injustice. And yes, that is completely correct. But, you know, when you have something as lucrative as we had, we're like, okay, fuck it. Find a way to, to, you know, beat these guys at their own game and find a way to start bearding and shit like that. So it turned into a giant operation. It's, it's a full-time job. And just to give you guys an idea of how we operate. So the full dog, he's the numbers genius. This guy is on another level in terms of sports betting and just his knowledge for the industry itself is, is off the charge. It's off the chart. Um, my role in the operation is more the accounts guy, right? I I'm responsible for moving money around, opening accounts, closing accounts, dealing with sports books when they misgrade a prop or misgrade a game or something like that. More, the, the guy that is, yeah, just basically doing all the administration work. And obviously I've taken on this, this task of, you know, being the social media guy, which I've fallen in love with. That's been pretty cool. Uh, but the full dog is really the guy that is the numbers guy and knows when sports books are cheating, like cheating in terms of like cheating on a line, uh, shading, he, you know, he recognizes, you know, good hedging opportunities. He recognizes when people are asleep late at night on halftime, shit like that. So mm-hmm. he's really that guy that is, he's the dangerous one. And I'm the guy that, just, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you make it, you make it work, but without him, it would be hard to make it work. Oh, absolutely. Without him. Uh, I don't think there's much there to be perfectly honest, but yeah, you know, it, it has become a two man operation because it's it's a grind and a half being on his side dealing with all the numbers and everything and you know there's not really much time in the day to be doing all the admin shit too and chasing the sports books when uh they're goofing around or kicking us out or whatever so i will say for those people who are listening pisky selling himself short a lot right now because the reality <laughs> is there are people that can win But winning at scale is also incredibly difficult. And it sounds like without you, Pisky, it would be much harder to win at scale. So that is an art in and of itself. And maybe you're not the numbers guy that can make it happen. But I think that there's something there that people, um, oftentimes they they will sell themselves short on because that is an art in and of itself. Being able to keep sportsbook accounts open for a long time, get as much money down as you can. Um, These are all integral parts of being a functioning group. Uh, I want to pick up on just something that you said there, which was interesting to me. Um, it, I guess it's more of a personal question, but you talked about how you guys are ultra conservative as a group relative to others, maybe. 
I'm just curious why you think that is personally, because you have now a longer track record of success. You've probably, your proof of concept is now like a reality where you guys are, are consistently winning money. Um, has there ever been uh, discussions about potentially scaling up the bet amounts, betting more of the bankroll? Uh, why do you think that you guys continue to remain conservative in nature? I think because we've had some scares along the way, right? I like to remind everyone that our journey is titled always betting, not always winning. So there are da- there are moments where, you know, the full dog and I have looked each other in the face and say, like, do we have a problem here? Are we idiots? Are we, you know, is, is this a, a gambling problem more than having an edge? Mm-hmm. Right. So there's always that factor, because I think if you're a sports better out there and you're making the assumption that you're just going to win forever on the systems that you currently have in place, you're, you're mistaking yourself because I'll give you guys an example. This is our, actually our second stint in Las Vegas. The full dog came down here in 2018. We had some really good uh, live edges that were making us really good returns. So we decided to test our look, luck, come down here to Las Vegas and take a shot at all the sports books here. And the NBA made a little change in the rules. Um, maybe you guys are aware of it, maybe you're not. It was the offensive shot clock. Right. So basically, when the, when you get an offensive rebound, you don't get a full 24, you only get 14 seconds, I think it is now. So we knew that there was going to be some change in totals. Uh, we did not expect totals to rise by, I think it was 20 points. And it put us in a very dangerous situation where, you know, by the end of the year, I think our models and, and our strategies were able to catch up. But Christ, out of the gate, man, it was it was really tough. Like the full dogs out here alone in Vegas were not winning. You could just imagine the anxiety and and just the, the the craziness involved in all that. And you know, I'm doing my best to pop in as as much as I could to help support and you know increase the morale. But it was it was really difficult. So. You know, again, uh, another thing I like to remind everyone is that this game is not easy, right? Uh, Sure, we do it for a living. Sure, um, you know, we've been very successful at it. But, you know, we're not stupid enough to go all in on sports betting. We do a lot of other things. Uh, I I like to remind everyone that as as well is that, you know, you know, we're into different things, whether it be cryptocurrency or stocks or precious metal. You know, we're betting on other things, not just sports. So I think it's that that really keeps us conservative and it's always, you always have to progress, right? You always have to be updating your models and, you know, we have to get better at, you know, building databases. Like the way we went, I know we'll get into it with the Lottery Corporation and what we did with them, you know, our our data was rock solid for that. So we had so much confidence in it, whereas this other stuff, uh, it's a little more difficult, right? There's a lot more variables to take into consideration. So I, I think the reason why we're so conservative is that we're not quite as confident in it as we were something like the Lottery Corporation. Fair enough. Project. Yeah. Okay, let's get into it. I think there's a lot of people that are interested in how like a like a lottery syndicate works in, in general, but I want to backtrack a little bit. So you work yeah. for the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Corporation. At that time, it might've just been OLG instead of OLGC or, or reversed, whatever. Um, what was your specific role within the OLG? Um, were you an odds maker? Or were you doing something else on the side? I just want to get the background on specifically what you were doing for them. And if, if that job in specific, like without having that specific job within the OLG, would you have been able to translate, you know, into the success that you had post OLG? Or was that like a requirement for you to build up all this, you know, this foundation of knowledge? Um, so the, ooh, I, I lost track there. What was too the first too much in one. Specific, yeah. <laughs> role, specific role within the OLG. Okay. My specific role with the OLG, I was a sports betting analyst. And yeah, I was... Re- required or my my role was to make the odds uh with the olg ton of handcuffs like we were operating with a system that was built in the early 90s that had static lines which means you, they couldn't move so whatever we put out <laughs> at 5 30 a.m on the morning of, of of the games we were stuck with that number yeah right um in terms of like volume. So listen to this, there was, 
90, we were only allowed putting out 99 events per list. So every, I think two or three days, they would put out a new list, but that list could only consist of 99 games. So if there was 500 games through college, you know, high season, right? There's a ton of games. Every, we can only choose 99. That's all the system. The system did not like three digit numbers. So again, this was something that was built as a game in the early nineties. And as sports betting has evolved and uh, just the industry has evolved, that's when these guys got into trouble with the system that they had there. Again, so many handcuffs. And to answer the question, like uh, we had a lot of, a lot of success against the lottery corporation after I had left. Uh, Could I have done that with, without the knowledge of working there? I don't think so. Because I, I saw the way the story goes is that I saw problems with the way they offered the game because of my background in the sports book industry. And I went to them, I think I went to them in like 2015. I said, listen, uh, what you're offering here, and it wasn't just the, the static odds and the parlay system and stuff. I went to them specifically about props and I said, you can't offer this. This is beatable. And they kind of chuckled at me. They laughed and, you know, gave me the old, you know, young grasshopper. This is your two page manual. Don't do anything less. Don't do anything more. Right. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane, essentially. So at that point, I'm like, OK, well, you know, Banfield Group had, had started and we had a lot of success with the middling and, and arbitrage that we were doing. So I went to the full dog and I said, dude, I think there's something here. Take a look at it. And that's like giving a bone to a dog like this guy, when I went to him with this or when I go to him with anything, he dives deeper than I'd say anyone else could dive. Mm -hmm. And he started, he started tracking, he started going through and, and tracking results and seeing what kind of odds and what would make sense, what would not make sense, testing different things. He was doing it all on his own. I didn't know much about it. I still work there. You know, it was just a job for me. I was concentrating on Banfield Group. And the reason why I left the corporation was because the full dog came to Toronto. And I'll never forget this day. He came to me with a big stack of papers. And he said, dude, it's time to leave. And I'm like, leave, leave what? Like, what are you talking about? He said, it's time to leave the lottery corporation. I'm like, why would I do that? And he handed me this evidence, if you will. And I remember looking through it and going, holy fuck. He's like, yeah, it's, it's go time. So I obviously, you know, didn't in the moment say, okay, I'm done with this. I gave it some thought. I looked over the documents again more and more. And I said, okay, you know, this is it. And I got lucky because the lottery corporation was going through, um, kind of a downsizing period, right? It was out of the pandemic. It, this is my assumption. This is not fact. I, I assume they just you know, lost a ton of revenue because all the casinos were closed. Sporting Sports were stopped for a, a good while. People weren't getting out of their house, buying their lottery tickets as much. So they had this thing called the volunteer exit program. So, uh, you know, obviously the data from the full dog combined with this volunteer exit program, like Christ, I have a parachute to get out of this thing. Uh, they're essentially going to pay me to leave and yeah, let's, let's go after them. And uh, we did, and uh, we, we caused a, a really significant amount of damage. Uh, the operation itself was, was wild. We had people all over the greater Toronto area going out uh, every game day. We, we bet. So it was a system, right? We, there was no thinking involved here whatever game was put out, whether it be Thursday night football, Monday night football, or anything on Sunday, we went out with the exact same system on the, on every single game that they put out. And uh, it was magical, man, to, to, to see everyone, uh, you know, all my friends in Toronto loved it because it was a side hustle for all of them. Uh, we had a, a great payment system that they would go out every Sunday morning and walk around and go store to store to store. And I, I can't even imagine what clerks, at gas stations and convenience stores thought about this because uh, we had a lot of, we had a lot of girls involved too. (laughs) A lot of attractive girls as well. Uh, That's a funny story that I like to tell because for anyone that is unaware, um, the lottery corporation to protect themselves had a system in place where you can only bet a hundred dollars maximum per ticket per store. 
So <laughs> our way around this is, uh, yeah, there were a lot of uh, attractive girls that were interested in getting involved with a side hustle. So we would send them out and, uh, you know, the, the male store owners would look at them and they'd, you know, smile and ask if they could play two, three, four hundred. And I think we all know the answer to uh, the male, <laughs> the male um, lottery operators. Uh, they would let them get away with, with quite a bit. And uh, yeah, uh, we went out and uh, did what we had to do. And uh, like I said, I, I tell everyone, this is going to be a documentary, a, a movie some way, someday, because uh, just the way everything uh, was orchestrated and the way it worked was was pretty magical. So what, what would you say, um, again, feel free not to give out the numbers if you don't want to, but like maybe even just an ROI or something, like how profitable was this system, so to speak? Uh, yeah, I don't like to give out the number. There's literally four people on this planet that know exactly what we did to them. Um, <laughs> There's a number, a, there's a number set. You can go on our TikTok feed and it's one of our pin posts. Uh, this is kind of what made us explode onto the TikTok scene. Uh, I took basically, I kept all our receipts. That's very important because, you know, if anyone wants to know where the money comes from, yeah. uh, you know, sports betting has a black eye. I, I, I've had run-ins with the Royal Bank of Canada that uh, think that at some point I was either laundering money or working for a terrorist organization. And it's fucking wild what uh, they've questioned me on. But yeah, so we've kept all our receipts. And, you know, when you play, when you cash a winning ticket, they give you a receipt. And I basically plastered every single winning receipt that we had, or, or most of them. It was got to save this. We, this, this. Is, we have it in a later question we'll, and we'll show the video. We'll show the video and that because this okay. is my favorite TikTok of the bunch, <laughs> which is, yeah, it, yeah, I think it's, we are the champions playing in the background, right? Yeah. It's a queen. It, it, it's such a good, well, we'll, we'll tease it. Don't worry. Everyone, you'll, okay. you'll get to watch get this to video, watch this if video. on the yes. YouTube for sure. Well, listen, like just, just because, and I know it's being like, you know, a lot of people like, oh, you're such a show. That, that, that's not the point of the video right here. I'm not looking to toot our own horns. What I'm looking to do is stick it to the guys that told me in 2015 and basically told me throughout my career at the OLG that, you know, you don't know anything. We know yeah. what we're doing here, you know, and it's, it's sticking it to the man is one of the greatest feelings yeah. of all time. No different than, you know, if you get traded in professional sports and you go back into the team that traded you and you put up three touchdowns in a game, right? Exactly. Like, the old revenge angle, you, you know, the yeah. old revenge <laughs> angle in sports. There's no better feeling. Let yeah. me tell you. So yeah, that, that TikTok, um, I remember putting it together. You know, I put a little bit on the ground and stuff like that. Sent a picture to the full dog down in Costa Rica. And he's like, dude, if you're going to do it, fucking do it. Okay. <laughs> so I spent like three days putting this shit all over my condo in downtown Toronto. Uh, just to film this 30 second TikTok video. And uh, yeah. And that, uh, that was kind of the, the, the story behind it. I forget where I was going with that though. So anyways, yeah. So Great it, was, it, was, it was profitable. The, the, yeah, the question. I oh, had, I okay. Yeah. It was okay, like more so of an ROI because some people, some people earn, let's say 1% and that's an amazing earn. If you're getting down tons of volume, yeah. tons of volume, yeah. right. And other people are like, okay, I can't get down that much, but I'm earning 10, 15% amazing earn as well. So there's different ways to win. W was this more of like a super high ROI kind of edge? Is that, that's what this I'm was extraordinarily high to the point where we told the ROI to our buddy, our mutual buddy, plus EV, at Bet Bash here in Vegas, we went out for dinner with him, and the full dog mentioned what the ROI was over a five-year span, and he said, "No, that's that's impossible." So again, I'm not the numbers guy. I'm not going to sit here and argue it and make a case for it. Um, the only number that we've put out there, and again, you can see it in that video that we just teased, is the number seven. Now, a lot of people have said, oh, congratulations, you know, 7,000, 700,000, 7 million, whatever. I am just leaving it at seven. That is the number. Seven billion dollars. <laughs> seven billion, seven trillion. It's somewhere in that neighborhood. <laughs> uh, 
I, I'm just leaving it there. I, I think that's a pretty cool mystery to have about all this. And, you know, maybe it comes out one day when we potentially write a book or make a documentary or something like that. But there are legit only four people on this planet that knows what the true number is. And uh, I, I just want to keep it like that. I, I think it's for cool sure. Fair enough. Effect. I like that. I like the mystery. Component. Understood. And, and, and I, I do like how this is something where, you know, it's, it is unique in a sense where it's like, okay, you quit your job, you hit it big and the edge is no longer there or it's drastically reduced given what I guess we'll talk about now, but it's cool how it was kind of like an opportunity for someone who quit a job at the place and then only had a small amount of time, right? Because you, you mentioned quitting in, what was it September, 2021 and, um, OLG kind of went offline. Was it on April 4th? Or was it a little bit after that? No, uh, February 1st. So February that, that 1st, was another yeah. factor. We knew because I worked there, I knew that it was the last year. Right. So I said, you know, it's, it's kind of now or never. And, and let's, let's press this as hard as we can. And uh, we did it. I if, did if it. You had I quit a year pri- if you had quit a year prior, would that have been a better, better financial move? Two years um, prior, five years prior? Probably, probably. I mean, again, like the full dog was doing things on his own on the side, right? So he had little crews. His mom was living in in Cornwall, and he he made mention he he never wanted to tell me too much because I was working on the inside, right? So I I couldn't play the product conflict of interest. That was a big no no at the OLG. So I knew he was doing something, and it was more or less testing, right? So he was doing it at a smaller scale. And then when he approached me, he's like, I really want to go after this and pedal to the metal, but we need you involved, right? Uh, to Just to facilitate everything. And I said, okay, you know what I mean? I, the numbers were the numbers. And I said, okay, this is a chance that we're going to take. And, you know, the golden pra- parachute was there to, to, to embrace my fall in case we fell directly flat on our face. Um, but yeah, that's so would we have... Could we have made more starting earlier? Potentially, potentially. I, I, I don't know though. It was uh, again something that was kind of in the moment and uh, just took the leap of faith when 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 I did. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I've played I played pro line my whole life growing up as well, and uh, I I noticed a lot of the same probably things that you guys did in betting, and I I never took advantage of it to the scale that you did, but. Uh, there was obviously the stale lines was a huge one for a long time. There was actually, you could play certain parlays that paid better. So like you would always play like a seven gamer. I can't remember the exact numbers, but like, I think it was never play a two gamer or five gamer or whatever. But was this all parlay betting for you at this time? Uh, yeah, we only did props. You had to, you had yeah, to, had to parlay, right? So my yeah. question is this, this is not disrespect to the Banfield group or anything along those lines. I know of other groups that were moving um, significant amount of money uh, in all sorts of lotteries across Canada. So whether that was Mise Jeux in Quebec, ProLine in Ontario, you had the the Western Canada, Sports Select, and whatever in Alberta, BC, all over the place. Play Montana over in the USA. No, yeah, just, no, just uh, but cross Canada operations, right? And um, one of them is a very good friend of mine. And I, I used to go out with him every now and then, catch up with him every couple months. And he'd just be like, Rob, like this last month, we lost 30 of the 31 days. Like, you know, it's, uh, or I, I've won one day in the last two months. I was quite, I quite literally watched a friend take a million dollar swing one night by the Phillies blowing a 5-1 lead in the bottom of the ninth to the New York Mets which is one of the most uncomfortable things because it killed every seven game parlay, every six game parlay. And that would have been like the win that they needed. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. did you get into these like long extended periods where you basically didn't win because I I make, I imagine there's just way more variance in this type of parlay betting. And I'm just curious how you dealt with that. Was there a point where you're like, "Ah, I've made a big mistake here. Like, you know, we're just getting killed on a nightly basis. Uh, walk me through what it takes to go through that because I don't think people appreciate how much different it is when you're just betting straights and you're winning 20 of the 30 days a month versus when you're betting parlays and you might go the entire month without win- without a winning day. Absolutely. Uh, this <laughs> this feat um, is not for the faint of heart. Um, again, I, I got to give credit where credit is due and that is to the full dog. This guy doesn't have 
ice water in his veins. This guy has liquid nitrogen in his veins. <laughs> like, honestly, on a different level, I'm not. I, I'm the guy that worries about everything, yeah. right? As you can tell, the, the grays are coming in at a rapid pace. I'm in the sports betting industry. I'm always panicking. But yes, the variance betting parlays the way we did was extremely high. Like some of the bad beats still haunt me to this day. Um, we were underwater for 10 straight weeks last year out of the gate. So from week one in the NFL to week 11, right? That's almost three months. We were underwater with that project. And then things started to pop like bang, bang, bang. And then there's that magical Buffalo game. Uh, I'm sure you guys are aware of it. Buffalo and the Patriots where basically every prop in the game went under. That was the grant. Yes. The wind game. Yeah. Uh, the gods of wind. Yes, uh, that was that was the grand salami. That was a beatdown of epic proportions. Basically, say like made us safe for the rest of the year, regardless of what would have happened. And but there were a lot of other like really profitable games as well, as well. But yes, this was something that you had to have a lot of faith in your data, a lot of faith in your numbers, and it wasn't so much there was no mental going into this, Mm -hmm. right? This was not something where we were handicapping games or something. This is, there was a flaw in their game, right? They were doing something that no other sports book on the planet would allow you to do. And we took advantage of that. So I think that's how we were able to power our way through. We had all kinds of prior data from years past saying, okay, these streaks are normal, right? We looked at this thing and said, okay, we're going out pretty heavily here. Like, are we prepared to deal with what could be very painful moments and really disgusting periods of time where, yeah, you're going to look in the mirror, you're going to jump on a FaceTime call and look at each other dead in the eyes and saying, are we doing the right thing here? Are we like fucking idiots? Is this, is, is this the way we go down after everything that we built? So yes, there were definitely moments of that. But we powered through, we trusted the data, and we trusted that the flaw was big enough for us to to profit on in the long run. So one more question in the evolution of the the OLG stuff. Um, When I was younger, I used to, you know, do probably the same thing that everyone else did, right? Pinnacle on one screen, pro line on the other. This is off. This is off. This is off. I'm going to the convenience store, going to throw together a $100 parlay. And over the long run, I think that I'm going to win. And I used to be able to do this maybe half an hour before the games started. And then it got to a point one year where I would go and it was like, okay, they feed the ticket through the machine and it spits out Ontario liability limit reached. And it's like, sorry, sir, you can't play this game anymore. And this is happening more and more and more. So obviously people are picking up on this. The, the provincial lottery is making changes. Did you notice that things got more competitive over time with what you were doing? And if so... How did, did you have to like change the model of the operation? Like, were you starting to bet way earlier in the mornings? Were you waiting till certain periods of time? Like, was there a a kind of a shift in the dynamic from when you first started doing this versus, you know, when ultimately when the edge went away? Uh, I think we were lucky because we solely played props, right? And we had a system that basically was very contrary to what square bettors would bet. Right. Because ProLine, that's that's the thing. That's why they never made changes at ProLine. That's why when I went to them with issues in the fundamentals of the game, they laughed at me. They scoffed at me because there are so many recreational betters yes. playing this thing. They're looking at that, the bottom line and they're just pointing at the revenue yeah, number and saying, saying hey, yeah, there's, no, know, there's no problem here. Right. Hey, let's set, yeah, settle yeah. down, sportsbook boy. Like, look <laughs> at this. You're right. You don't know what you're talking about. But and, and and that's and that's why it's such a shame that it went away because you know after I, I put out that TikTok and we you know started to, to to grow our social and online presence, there were some groups that reached out to me. You know, Plus EV was one of them. That you know, I got to sit down with these very smart individuals. Uh, Proline John is another one. Shout out to him, Rob. I think you maybe have had lunch with them before, right? I have like, had lunch. Like hang- I've had yeah, lunch with up him in Yorkville. The, uh, no, no I, not Yorkville. He came to okay. me. Uh, okay. in, in the Kleinberg Village area. So yes, but I have had lunch with. He Roland. is gonna go nuts when he hears this on the episode. Oh yeah, he listens. Yeah, to, yeah, he yeah. told me listen to every episode, and uh, he's like, "You got to do. You guys got to do more, man. You got to do like three a week." I'm like, <laughs> "You know how hard it is to do one a week? Like, come on." You, you sound like him by just imitating yeah. him there. No, shout out to him. He's a great guy, and uh, 
yeah, he, he's told me, he's like, hey, you better uh, sharpen your skills if you're going on the uh, the, the Pozzola podcast because these guys know what they're talking about and they're sharp. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I'm going to do the best I can. But yeah, shout out to Proline John. You know, he, uh, I've had many lunches with him. Great guy. Well, once we get talking, oh my goodness, it goes on for hours and hours. But he gave me a little glimpse of the operation he had going on and man oh man like i thought what we had was sophisticated and i'm like dude we should do a like a combined documentary and get everyone talking about this thing but yes there were a ton of different groups doing different things and again i i think we were very fortunate because we were going after props and from majority of the groups that i've spoken with they would go after props if there were significant line discrepancies, right? If they had Stefan Diggs at, uh, if, you know, if the pro line had them at, at 85 and a half and his number was 92 and a half type of thing, you know, they'd go after that and just line moving. What we were doing was completely different. So I think that's why we never faced uh, liability limit issues. We were able to get down everything we needed to get down on props. It's very rare that they would take a prop guy off the board uh, simply because the numbers never s- skew too far from what they set them at, right? So you're not getting, um, you know, for example, a, a minus seven turning into a minus three. Props kind of always stays in the area of what it was set at. So that's why we never ran into to troubles like that. Rob, you never ran into a liability issue. He was the liability He was the issue. liability issue, yeah. Uh, no, I, Was I, that uh, Proline John? No, you. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. well te- technically, if you didn't run into a liability issue, that means you, that means however much money you made, it could have been more. I, yeah. Yes. In theory. Uh, okay. I mean, I guess, <laughs> yes. It, it, what we the, the difficulty that we got into um, was just like how many people can you possibly have going out, right? Like I, I can't imagine what it looked like on their end. You know, seeing all the convenience stores in the downtown core, bang, hundred, bang, hundred, and then again some of the girls and some of the people that knew some of the store owners got a little bit more down and it, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine what, what it looked like. And it was, it was really difficult. There's really so much time in a day, right? We got started on an NFL Sunday. I was up at 5 30 AM, right? The full dog would send me the combinations from Costa Rica because there were slight modifications depending on what the prop cards looked like. Yep. So he would send me the combinations and I would have to fill out every single one of those goddamn tickets uh, manually. People don't realize like it's, it's a Scantron card that you have to. Yes. Uh, yes. Continue. Yeah. We, we looked into having a company sort of make us a, a program that we could just sort of put into a printer. It, it didn't work out. So this was manual labor. And to the point where like, even my my girlfriend shout out to her god bless her soul because she would sleep until about like 7 30 but then she knew it was like real crunch time but from 5 30 i'd have to print out so okay i'll, I'll take you guys through the entire this is awesome yeah, yeah prep really process yes. right so 5 30 a.m my alarm goes off i already have emails waiting for me from the full dog he put the combos together i would go in i would print them all because Every envelope we would stuff. So every combo that we went on out on was $300. So on the envelope itself, we would write the combo. because So card number, events, uh, and combination. And the reason we did that, because when our runners went out, and sometimes, you know, clerks, just force of habit, they would basically take the selection slip and rip it up, throw it out. Well, then they're like, okay, well, I didn't finish my envelope. How the hell do I know which combo it was? So then you would just go and look at the combination on the envelope and fill out your form again, right? So the printer's on fire from basically 5.30 to 6.30, nonstop envelope after envelope after envelope. And then I would take all those envelopes, pile them literally this high on my kitchen table and go through with the the prop selection forms and fill them out one by one, depending on what the envelope said. I would then take the, the selection slip, put it in the envelope. Now it's ready for stuffing. And I would do that. Honestly, that would take two, two and a half hours. And then I would go to the kitchen counter and uh, there was a money counting machine because this is all cash based. Yep. And I would take the cash and set it to $300 and it would boom, 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 300, boom, in an envelope. That envelope's done. Boom, 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 300. In, next envelope, next envelope, next envelope. So that would take place for a good hour. 
And then it was time to separate it. We had different runners, again, all over the GTA. So I would say, okay, this person's good for, let's say 10,000 for the day. I'd, I'd take out 10,000 worth of envelopes, make sure I documented everything. Okay, boom. And then, but another thing that we had to be careful was, was time, right? Because there's only a certain amount of time before the one o'clocks go off. There's only a certain amount of time before the four o'clocks go off, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd have to strategically give them a safe amount of one o'clocks, four o'clocks and the night game, right? So they could get it all done. And then once that was all separated, uh, I had the ground crew, they would come to the condo in, in Toronto, they'd get all their envelopes, they'd go out on the ground, and then I'd go, I'd drive to Etobicoke, race down the Gardner Expressway, drive to Etobicoke, where I'd meet the guys that would do the biggest betting for us. And uh, I would meet them, give them their stack of envelopes, and then I would be off to do my own thing, right? I, I would basically, Scarborough, Scarborough was great for me. Uh, there were some malls there that I could basically just pinball. So you just basically run around the mall. There was like eight different kiosks. And I'd go around, do my eight you know, go for a coffee, do the eight again, <laughs> go for lunch, do the eight again. <laughs> and yeah, it was just absolutely wild. And then at the end of the day, yeah, you know, you throw on uh, the games and you cheer in the combos and hope for the best. And uh, then the process of going to picking, picking up all these envelopes, right? Because some of them would win and when they would connect, fucking, they would fucking connect. So there's a lot of like hot tickets out there. So I'd have to go collect those and then, then the, you have the challenge of cashing everything. Uh, ex exactly what I was going to get at, because <laughs> you have the $1,000 limit before you have to show up in person to cash it. Exactly. So all our tickets were strategically um, set so that they wouldn't pay over $1,000. Perfect. Right? Because I don't want to go to the price center. They probably know who I am, and yep. I, I'm not dealing with that. And then there's questions, right? They interrogate you just as bad as the RBC does when you're trying to, you know, send funds to offshore sports books. It's the Royal it's Bank crazy. of Canada for, for those who don't know. What the <laughs> Royal RBC Bank. Is. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so I had to, yes, strategically make everything pay under a thousand dollars. That's why we were betting in 300. So it was basically like all our combos were either betting fifties or 25s. Yep. So when one of our runners would go to a, a lottery operator, it would be, you know, run this ticket four times or run this ticket twice, yep. boom, 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 to keep everything under a thousand. So the cashing thing was insane. So this was like a hardcore full-time job. I would dedicate specific days just to go cash because like, first of all, who the fuck has cash on hand these days, right? Everything's digital, Yeah. but you know, uh, store clerks would, or store owners would get a cut, right? I think they got 2% on cashing. So once you go in there a few times with a stack and they're like, like, what the hell is this guy doing? First of all, but they're like, okay, well, this is free money for me. And we're going through a tough time pandemic, right? Like they wanted as much action as I could give them. So you start to become friends with these people and they're like, okay, I know I'm good for 10,000. Okay. I'm good for 20,000, 30,000. You know what I mean? And then you start building your way up. So that helped me out a lot, but I would literally have to go everywhere. I'm talking like, Etobicoke, as far out as Brampton, all across the G uh, all across downtown Toronto, inside the path, eastern Toronto, <laughs> everywhere. I had uh, I had people that would help me out. Uh, Scarborough was was huge for us, and uh, yeah, and then you know those were cashing days, and then you get all the cash back. Now you got to separate the cash, right? Because they're paying you in whatever they have. I I would request hundreds, but that wasn't always conducive. So now you know you're you're separating all the cash. You're getting ready for the next week because you're sending a ton out there on a weekly basis and the process goes over and over and over again. Yeah. So, so what, wild. what Pisky is describing is an incredibly wide radius um, that from downtown Toronto to Brampton is like about a 45 minute drive. Depends on where you are in Brampton. It could be longer than that. Well, the, on a Sunday, a little, 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 less, little, little less, but the, the underground path for people who don't know, the, it's it's literally an underground path in Toronto that looks like kind of like a shopping mall underneath the city that connects subway stations that have like all these different booths and stuff like that. Um, that's qu quite a widespread operation for people who can't really uh, appreciate the perspective of of how far that reached. Um, this is like a super impressive, uh, whatever you want to call it here, operation, syndicate, something like that. But it's super impressive given how like people don't realize if you've never actually played a pro line, if you don't know how it works, like you're not, 
you're not going up to a sports book ticket writer, just so you guys know. You're going up to literally the guy who uh, works at the convenience store behind the counter, right? So they're used to the majority, 99% of people are going in paying for gas, paying for gas at a gas station and, and or buying a chocolate bar or whatever, or buying a lottery ticket like a Lotto 640 yen or something like that. Pro line's a small percentage. So when you go there with a card, it's like what Pisky's saying. If you... If you don't have that card specifically, you don't know how to write, write it up. Like these guys will make mistakes sometimes, stuff like that. They're not always the the most careful, nor do the majority of them even know like what the sport is, any of the players, anything like that. As opposed to like a ticket writer in Vegas or at a sports book in the USA, where you go and you're like, "Hey, give me the Maple Leafs minus one fifty. They'll give you the ticket." These guys are like, you're giving them a scantron paper as if you wrote out a test in high school. And they're feeding it through a machine and giving you the ticket. And then you're like probably telling them, okay, play this three, play this three times, this three times, this three times. So like, I could only imagine the amount of errors. I was also going to ask Pisky, like how many lost tickets in there? You know what? Our team shout out to them. They were so efficient. They were so good. I think throughout the duration of the year, we maybe had like three mistakes. Like it was that good. And the amount of tickets that were purchased like again, you'll you'll see the the video of of all the winning receipts, but you know, think about the boxes of losers, right? Because we didn't win every single ticket. There were majority of them lost, right? It's just when you connected, you fucking connected. Well, they're all part so, of it, so to to expect to win over fifty percent is insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. There was there was a ton of losses. Like <laughs> I remember, we would take all our losing tickets, and because you never know, right? Sometimes maybe the clerk throws away the, the ticket and then our runner fills out the selection slip wrong. So we basically took every single losing ticket and gave it to some family members and said, okay, your job is to just check these, check in the envelope, make sure there's no cash left, mm -hmm. go through every single ticket, scan them to make sure there's no winners. And sometimes there were right. Because Hey, like I, it's five 30 in the morning on a Sunday, I filled out the box five instead of box four, right? It happens. It didn't happen often. So you never know when you have a, an envelope full of winners and one envelope is like, I don't know, it was anywhere from like, let's say 5,000 to 9,000, right? So that's, that's significant, obviously. So it, it was, it was wild, wild. Um, what were other like crazy ass stories? I, I, I was Just, always wondering about bad runners, like, because if a runner sees what you're doing, right, I'm mm -hmm. wondering if they take their $25 tickets and then they pull 500 bucks out of pocket and say like feed it through another five or six times. And like, I, I, it's a risk on the runner's end because they're part of something good, but you mm -hmm. always have that. Uh, maybe I'm just speaking too much from experience of someone who's like greedy in a sense that they're like, yeah, yeah you know what? They don't need to know type of thing. So I was curious if you had any situations with a runner that just kind of like was a potential threat to blowing up the operation. I mean, our, original warning to all our runners was you know you're getting paid a good good salary we would give them five percent of whatever they bet so if you can get down 5k in a day you get five percent of 5k wait, if you can get as that a free as a free roll or, so or, no losses no or losses just in general yeah wait wait did you just pay that out regardless if if whatever they whatever they played they would get five percent so if if you want to do a short day and whatever every wait, every time on, you play hundred dollars he's, he's not he's not saying five percent of winnings yeah, yeah. He's so, saying you're you saying, five, so you're saying you just gave five percent off the top just for getting the volume down yes that can That's, give you perspective was, on what the ROI is right, on this so operation. that will give that gives you all you need to know on if the ROI <laughs> is, is, uh, is higher like I said I I'm not the numbers guy I'm not going to sit here and debate what the ROI is. Plus so, EV said it was impossible. The full dog says I have the data, so I'm going to leave it to those. Fair two. enough. Those no, guys I mean, are math geniuses. Not so. Me. Here's what, I'm gonna, what I got asked then is, did you give them anything extra in addition to the five percent of volume? At the end of the season, uh, there was we always like to throw a party, so we <laughs> we always like to have fun what too. That's another thing about this. Been. This is this is one. This is some of the greatest <laughs> talk I've ever heard. Like. <laughs> <laughs> what I would have given to be a part of this operation is like a lot. You know what? I haven't talked about this too much. I, I think you guys might be the first. Like I've mentioned bits and pieces here and there, but never uh, to this depth. So, I, you know, it's out there. And that's why I always say I'm pretty sure it can be a movie. I, I'm telling you. But uh, yes, here at the Banfield Group, we, we love to have a good time, right? We work, we work really hard during 
high season, but we always like to treat the people that help us out. You know, we like to, to, to show them. So what, what we did for the, the ticket project party, we invited everyone uh, for a dinner. I always like going to the keg down on King Street in oh, Toronto. What a what? spot. Uh, You're <laughs> yeah. like preaching to the choir right here. Yeah. Uh, honestly, guys, like, you know, obviously this was a ton of hard work and a lot of ups and downs, but I always enjoyed going to watch the Thursday game. I would put my hoodie on, put put the Lulus on, throw throw it. super casual, right? Yeah. Get my ball cap out. I'd probably pop a gummy and I'd go sit at the corner of the bar at the King, keg on King Street in Toronto I'd order myself a nice baseball steak. All the I'd baseball watch, yeah. <laughs> which they can't they can't cook past medium rare because of yes, the, absolutely oh, yeah. And I would What's sit the there What's the in heaven. Um, I, I would go low carb. I'd go Brussels sprouts okay. off the menu. Brussels yeah. sprouts off the menu. No, it is yeah. definitely is definitely a, a, a good a good order. I mean, I'm, yeah. some I'm, go the I'm, twice I'm, baked, I'm a twice some, baked guy. Some go garlic twice mashed. Baked. Yeah. <laughs> I've been going recently with the cauliflower mash, underrated. You know, roast me, it's all good, but it's an underrated yeah. dish. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I, I love the. I'm not a, I'm not a chain guy, but I love the keg. I, I find it very consistent, and it's just a cool, chill place to hang out. And like I said, I, I would probably start with. I'd go completely off the board. Sometimes I'd start with a fucking martini, and then you know, get a glass of wine with dinner, and I would be in heaven. And I, I remember I would send out a a group text to some of my runners and some of my close buddies and say, Look, guys, it's Thursday. You know where I'll be. If you want to join by all means, but I, you know, sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't, if they wouldn't, I wouldn't give a shit. I would be in my glory, just sitting there enjoying the game and, and having a nice steak. But yeah, for, for the party, we went to the keg. We had a blast out there, drinks, food, everything. And then our surprise to the group was I had uh, this thing called the circus bus waiting outside for us. So we put everyone, it's, it's basically an, a school bus that has been gutted out. There's um, benches inside, and I got them to put in a giant ball pit. So the, the, those plastic balls that you slide into at McDonald's when you were a kid, yeah, that was in the middle of our bus. So we got on there, we plugged in the phone, we had the tunes, and we just drove around. We had a bunch of seltzers going on, and for the next two hours, we just drove around the GTA and our first thought, this is the best part, this still my, like some of my top runners still like give me a big hug about this every time they say it, this was the most glorious thing. Our first stop in the party bus was at the OLG headquarters and they have a big sign out there saying the OLG prize center and we all got out and we took a massive group picture, all putting up the number seven, <laughs> just to, to let everyone know, let the lottery corporation, again, this isn't something about bragging. You know, I, I don't think we're smarter than anyone else. There was an opportunity. We took advantage of this opportunity. But sticking it to them is, again, one of the best feelings I've ever had in my life. I'm, so. I'm all for a great spot yeah. story. Like yeah. just you what know, a story! I, I, I indeed what a story. <laughs> By the way, the keg does not pay us for for any sponsorships. But if they did, I would one hundred. If you yeah. go, if you go to the keg in Toronto and then you fly to Vancouver and go to the keg in Vancouver or or in Halifax or whatever different parts of Canada and you order the same dish, it's gonna come out the exact same way. Like the consistency at the keg, it's not the best awesome. steakhouse in the world. But if you are an American and you ever come up to Toronto. You get a solid steak for a good price, and it'd be very, very consistent wherever you go. Yeah. And you you, huh? you won't pay for a bad steak there. They don't they no. don't mess up, and if they do, you better believe they're comping that or giving you something. Which oh yeah, is unbelievable oh, yeah. service at the Keg Steakhouse and Bar. See you tonight. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, tons of value at the the Keg, and it's good to get away because sports guys usually, you know, what are you doing? You're sitting in a pub. You know, eating pub grub, chicken wings, French fry. You can't do that. Like I'm fucking running around the city of Toronto. All of, like the amount of steps that I put in last year. I'm telling you, I, I think I crushed world records <laughs> because there was so much walking around. And I'm like, no, this I deserve. I deserve this little treat every Thursday night. And uh, the vibe there, the vibe, you know what I mean? You can go and have a great meal and it's kind of laid back. And, you know, the people are friendly. I, I just love it. I have nothing but good things to say. And that's the only chain I will support, to be honest. Fair <laughs> enough, and as as will I. So, uh, okay, I guess getting into the next chapter here then, uh, what I did want to ask, you will see, obviously, people are like, okay, well, this is so good. Like, why is, why is Pisky on the podcast talking about this? Like, what happened? Like, is he not doing it anymore? He retired, quit? What is it? So, 
Uh, I just want to ask, I guess, we know the answer. We've mentioned it a few times, but t- talk us through kind of like that edge evaporating, going away, why it went away, what happened, and then, you know, what, what OLG has to offer now. Yeah, it's, it's sad. <laughs> Uh, and not just for myself, for the other very sharp groups that are out that were out, sorry that were out there uh, doing things that were very similar to what we were doing. Uh, the lottery corporation changed their system, right? As of February first, twenty twenty two, they went to a more traditional sportsbook style system where you can now make straight bets um, and this old antiquated system that they could not change their odds and they had to put everything out the night before it went away. They basically threw it in the garbage. It was done. It was over with. So the opportunity, the, the error that they were committing that we were taking advantage of disappeared, gone forever. So uh, I never like to get too deep into what exactly they were doing. I'm sure, you know, you guys are sharp betters. Uh, there's a lot of sharp betters out there that I'm sure can put two and two together of what they were doing. I don't like to go into depth too much because I'm hoping that one day that, you know, there's a sports book out there that will get greedy and make the same kind of mistake. And then, you know, we will, we already have the data. So we will jump into action and go after them instantaneously right now in the current form, there's nothing like it. Um, But you never know, right. Things change. And uh, that's, that's why I never like to go too deep into it, but that's what happened. It, it went away and then it was time to move on. And uh, I remember coming out to Bet Bash here in Vegas yep. uh, in April. Uh, that's when the full dog and I were together for the first time in person. And he said, what's next? You know, obviously we got to make a move. Um, and in the moment, you know, it just came up. It was the first suggestion. He's like, what do you think about Vegas? And I'm like, I would do Vegas. I, I, I would, I would come out here. I said, but you got to promise me one thing. Like you, you can't, like we were starting with the whole social media thing, right? With TikTok and, and Twitter. And I, I, I love it. I am I'm fully invested in it. I, I love building the community and creating, you know, just the story, the story of Banfield group. Um, but I told him, I'm like, dude, you know, I, I'm new at this stuff. I, I don't really know what I'm doing. A lot of times I'm just throwing mud at the wall and hoping that it sticks. So if it's just for social media, like I can't come out to Vegas and just do content. Like that's crazy. Right. I said, you got to, you know, promise me, like, is there um, uh, a benefit of me being out here for the betting operation? And he said, absolutely. Right. I mentioned it earlier on. He's like, fuck, I've been staring at the Don best screen for years and looking at places like the Mirage and Westgate and, you know, even, even Circa, because we knew that, you know, they welcomed winners and didn't kick winners out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we made the decision. I'm like, okay, fuck it. I'm going to Vegas. That's it. I'm doing it. So I had to run that by the girlfriend. I did not expect good things to come out of that conversation, <laughs> but she was on board. She's like, yeah, fuck it. Let's do it. And I think it was a combination of like, okay, you know, you know moving on to the next thing, new adventure fun. But, you know, obviously we've all had a rough, really, really rough past two years, right? We were basically in shackles, in lockdown. So this was something that I'm like, no, I, I'm fucking going. I want to change. I want to go after it. I want to be free. And uh, that's how it all came together. So what made you decide to do a drive across the continent? Because you, <laughs> you, you, I saw the Jeep. I've seen the pictures yeah. of Jeep on social the media. Uh, the Betmobile, I think the license plate's betting 247, right? We bet 247. We bet 247. Yes. <laughs> Always betting. <laughs> we bet 247. Yeah. Okay, so... Obviously, you could take a flight from Toronto to Vegas pretty easily. Uh, I guess it's probably to do with your commitment to content. But walk me through that discussion of like, okay, we're going to just get this Jeep. We're going to drive to Vegas. We're going to stop at a bunch of places along the way. Um, Curious what led to that decision. Uh, Yeah. Uh, So again, Banfield Group, we like to have a lot of fun, right? Uh, as serious as sports betting has to be at times, we like to, and again, if you follow us on, on social, you can see that I, I like to have fun with it. I like to keep things easy and, and light, but this was something that, uh, I've always wanted a Jeep Wrangler. I, I'm talking, that was one of the things that I think got me through the pandemic that I, I just watched Jeep video after Jeep video after Jeep video on YouTube. I can't even explain why. Maybe a sense of adventure, sense I, of being I, free. I'm with you, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I love Jeeps. And in the summer, especially, being able to take the doors off. The oh, Jeep. yeah. I don't know why I love that concept, yeah. but I see a Jeep like that and I'm like, 
I'm sold. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it, this has been a dream of mine forever. So um, I, I, I had like, I went through, hey, you're younger, you don't really know. So I, I had an Audi before that. And I'm like, oh, I'm kind of done with that. You know, I want just something that I can drive anywhere, drive over things. Right. So I, I changed it up. And the full dog and I, we had a few conversations like, you know, what's best for content, content and betting. And we know how busy things get during the football season. So we're like, fuck, we have to have fun now, right? The summer is our time to go. We don't do a lot of baseball. So it's like, okay, let's make this. So how are we going to do this? And we just came to the idea of, fuck it, let's do a road trip. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, Toronto to Vegas? Like, that's intense. So we looked it up. I think it was 36 hours if we did it straight. But he's like, no, leave it to me. Full Dog's a great planner. He, he, he loves like looking up hotels and finding deals. He's a great better and, and like he's, a, he's a travel yeah. guide as well. Everything yeah, yeah. Is- man of, man of, he just, <laughs> He just built a fortress down in Costa Rica too. Like we got some Airbnb stuff going on down there. So he's into that too now. Like the guy, the guy does a bit of everything. He's an all-time so, arbitrager. That's what all, it is. All-time arbitrager. Probably like searching all these hotel sites and getting you incredible, incredible <laughs> value finds for sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, that's exactly <laughs> what he did. Uh, and he made sure that you know we were close to either casinos or sporting events or something like that. Like it, he, he basically planned like a trip of a lifetime. So I left it to him and then I'm like, okay, well, yeah, I'm going to get this Jeep and fuck it. I'm, I'm turning it into the Batmobile and shout out to plus EV. He was the one that actually named it the Batmobile. Cause I was thinking the Banfield mobile or whatever, Jeep, whatever. No, he's like, no, Batmobile is the way to go. So yeah. It is, a, it is a pretty yeah, solid it's a good pun. It's a good yeah, pun. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pun. solid. Yeah, I don't like to give him uh, credit too often, but. <laughs> you know. So uh, so then, yeah, the full dogs started putting together this trip and, uh, I went and got, I, I turned it into the Betmobile with the always betting on the side and our logo. And, uh, I put a big thing on the spare wheel in the back that screams always betting podcast. So it was like, okay, we're driving across country and we're going to do content the entire way. We got in a couple podcast episodes and, um, yeah, just did TikToks the entire way. And the Godfather, so he was the third man in this fucking crazy ass trip that we put together. The Godfather is the third member on our podcast. And I worked with him at the OLG. He's the one that hired me at the OLG. So I worked side by side with him for the last 13 years. He's basically my second father. And when I told him about this plan of the road trip and stopping at casinos and uh, sporting events along the way, he's like, fuck me. He goes, I want to come. <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious? And now, you know, the Godfather's got a family. He's got three young daughters. He's got a wife. And he's like, yeah, no, I, I've never done something like this. I want to come. So he sat in the back of that Jeep the entire way and kept us company. Um, he's big into the espressos. Yeah. So we made sure to incorporate some espresso reviews throughout the United States. And uh, let me tell you, there's not too many great espressos from Toronto to Vegas, believe it or not. Uh, but yeah, we, we just had a great time with it. and. Um, yeah, the stops were uh, because sports betting has, has expanded in a way that we never thought possible, right? We're, we're coming from the offshore industry where everything was like taboo, right? Like, and, and that's a reason too why um, if, if you go onto our social and you notice that everything is in black and white, there's a reason behind that. Uh, we're the gray area guys. We've always been the gray area guys, right? We're always the guys involved in sports betting. So when I started creating content, I, I just, I don't know, everything was black and white. It kind of fit our theme and we're the gray area guy. So we just stuck with it. And now it's a thing. That's it. And all of the content is black and white. So that's the reason behind that. But we decided to set up um, stops along the way uh, amongst at casinos to check out their sports betting landscape in different states and uh, ball stadiums. Right. I, I think we, we, we stopped at four different ball stadiums altogether. So yeah, it, it was, it was an incredible trip. If you're ever looking for a great espresso, it's no, no finer one than at the bet stamp headquarters. So we'll have you and the Godfather over here. Oh, we take our right. espresso very, I had one before the show in our custom bet stamp espresso cups right here. Uh, beautiful, beautiful, but we should do something. We should link up in the summer. If you're back in Toronto, I guess at any point, what are the plans? Uh, do, do you plan to come back or? You just kind of yeah. in Vegas for as long. As yeah, you- no, I, I'm I'm here in Vegas. I'm not working, right? Well, I'm betting, right? So it's a kind of a recreational thing. This is not set up to be a business or anything like that. I'm basically here as a snowbird on an extended stay. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, we crossed the border on August 15th. So my time, if you include it, so the rules are, are kind of murky, right? As a Canadian, you're allowed to spend six, six months, months in the US. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but is that six months consecutively? Like I know we were here in Bet Bash. I was here for a week in April and everything online is kind of like murky. So I ended up calling the border patrol and they basically said, uh, when you cross at Christmas, have a discussion with the border patrol agent and see what he says, right? Because I would have been fine. Like the plan here was to leave uh, at the end of January. But seeing as though I spent this entire football season here in Vegas, I'm like, okay, you know, it'd be really cool to spend the Super Bowl here, right? So that's another two weeks away right. after the end of January. But it works perfect. And because if you said August 15th, that takes you to February 15th, Super Bowl's mm-hmm. February 12th. That's but yeah. is it by yeah. calendar year? Like, what is it? Like, that's ah, what he's saying. Like, I see. Well, that's, yeah, that's the thing. The, the week at Bet Bash is what was complicating things because there was an extra seven days there. So does that count towards the total? Ah, Anyways, yeah. I, I still don't have the exact answer, but I did just go home for Christmas and I spoke with the Border Patrol agent as I crossed. And I'm like, listen, I've been in Vegas a while. Um, I'm, you know, just there, basically vacationing. I'm doing some betting. Uh, can I stay for Super Bowl? It's an extra two weeks. You know, I'm sure you can see that I've been here a while. And he hemmed and hawed and looked and clicked his computer a bunch of times. And he said, yeah, no problem. He gave me an extension, actually a six month extension and said, yeah, enjoy the big game. And, uh, you know, just make sure that when it's said and done that you you head back north and you get, get back on your side of the border. I said, okay, no problem. So are you still an Ontario tax resident or no? We could talk. To uh, yes. Yeah, 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 I am. And uh, so that, that's another thing that's come up with this tax thing. So I, I want to I start this by saying I am not a tax expert. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm just going to tell you what I was told. So we have a gaming lawyer in Toronto that I sat down with prior to coming out here to Vegas. And I explained what we were doing and what we we're trying to do. And I'm like, taxes. And, and he said, Pisky, just pump the brakes a second. He goes, first of all, you know, I, I know a lot about the gambling industry and I know you guys are sharp and I know you're, you know, you're expecting to win long term, but make the money first, make the money first. And then when you come back to Canada, then we can figure out, you know, what needs to be taxed, what doesn't need to be taxed, because there's a complication there, right? Tax uh, gambling earnings are not taxable in Canada. So there's there's complications there. And I, I'm just taking his advice where we're going to see the season through and we're going to see where we end up. We did a lot of contests out here, uh, Circus Survivor, Circus Millions, uh, Westgate, everything, William Hill. So we do, I, it doesn't look like we're going to cash in any of those. So that kind of comes off the top too. So anyways, yeah, big complication. I'm not sure about the tax thing, but we'll figure that out when I get back to Canada. So yes, to answer the question, I am going back to Canada uh, in February. Uh, my brother's out west in uh, Calgary. Hmm. And my plan is to drive north there, uh, spend some time. Uh, he's got two young little boys and spend some time as Uncle Pisky and then eventually make my way back to Toronto. Uh, my girlfriend, you know, wants to be back around her family and, and Toronto makes the most sense for us right now. So we're going to head back there and then uh, see what the next chapter is. That, awesome. that drive from Calgary to Toronto is going to be a bad one. Like yeah. you're going to see a lot of, uh, of corn and wheat, I guess, <laughs> through the central uh, Manitoba and uh, northern Ontario. But ooh, that's going to be a rough one. Yeah, my girlfriend's already extracted herself from that situation. She <laughs> says, I, gonna fly. Uh, I will gladly go north. I think it's about 18, 19 hours. Uh, we're going to do stops, I think, in Utah, Idaho, and Montana along the way before we get to Calgary. And then she says, I'll stay in Calgary a bit, but I'm flying to Toronto. I'm not doing that one. And then uh, I think my dad said that, you know, maybe I'll come out and we can do the drive together and stop at some junior games along the way home and stuff like that. So that's kind of on the table right now. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see. But yeah, we are in the Betmobile and uh, it has four wheel drive. So I'm excited to uh, get her into the snow and uh, make our way uh, <laughs> east. <laughs> but yeah, it's not going to be easy. What was your favorite spot that you stopped at on route from, on route from Toronto to Vegas? All right. So I made a list for you guys. I made a list of basically our itinerary from Toronto to Vegas. And uh, I, I think you guys and the listeners will enjoy this. So right out of the gate, uh, we crossed at the Detroit border. 
Uh, that was an experience to Let see to you. see Joey Kanish obviously in Detroit. You're <laughs> one one of the Uncle K, Uncle K, a big part of the Hammer Betting Network, friend of ours. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, we follow him on Twitter. I've seen some clips of him. He's a he's a pretty entertaining guy. So yeah, <laughs> shout out to Joey Kanish. But uh, crossing at the border uh, with a weird, as weird of a story as we had. So we're three dudes. One's a resident of Costa Rica. One's in, and then there's two Toronto. I sold everything in Toronto. I didn't want to have any loose ends. I, I, I was renting at the time. It was a pretty expensive condo. So I'm like, I'm getting this off the book. So I got rid of all my shit. Uh, so that, that was kind of confusing. That was, that was tough. And I remember crossing the border and the border patrol, you know, when we told them that we were going to Vegas, he kind of laughed and chuckled and made some sort of joke about a strip club or something like that. And yeah, we're like, okay, we're, this is going to be easy. And then boom, he slaps a sticker on the windshield. He's like, yeah, you're going to want to pull in there. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've had that trip before. Ooh. Yes. So, and then, then, then it got like, then it was nerve wracking. Right. So you get out, uh, we brought some cash over the border more than I've ever brought in before, you know, just to fund all the sports books out here. And so, you know, there was an explanation that was due there and they had to count the money and then they spoke to us as a group and then they spoke to us all individually. And then they searched the Betmobile left, right. They they searched everything. They went through all our luggage and the biggest stickler sticking point was the full dog. So what he does because he lives in Costa Rica and Amazon isn't really like a big thing there. Uh, Every time he comes to Toronto, he'll order like clothes for his daughter. Yep. Right. Little baby clothes, essentially. So he had ordered a bunch of shit from Amazon. We had it in the Betmobile. And that was the Border Patrol's focus. He's like, what the hell is baby clothes, our baby clothes doing in the car with three dudes? You guys have families here. There's shit going on. Spill your beans. And we're like, no. And we tried to tell this story of like Amazon and, and whatnot. And they they had they didn't want nothing to do with it like they thought we were full of shit but eventually we pleaded our case like listen we're not doing anything we're not supposed to we're literally going to vegas so yeah that was a bit of an experience we ended up getting through that was great we spent the night in detroit going to all the casinos uh, you got to be careful there when you're walking around at night there's i don't know it's a little dodgy at times in certain areas so that that was an experience but uh, some of the sports books were really cool. The Barstool sports book, I think it might have been in the Motown Casino, was actually pretty nice. So that was cool to see what they had going on there. And then we made our way to Indianapolis. That was our second stop. Mm-hmm. We stopped there for an Indianapolis Indians game, uh, AAA baseball, mm-hmm. uh, dollar hot dog night. Probably went a little bit overboard there. That wasn't a great feeling, but <laughs> cool experience. Great ballpark, really nice. Indianapolis was really clean. So we had, we had some good times there. Uh, the next stop on the trip was, again, uh, as much as we're always betting, we're always learning as well, East St. Louis. So East St. Louis is actually in uh, Illinois. I did not know that. That is just over the bridge from regular St. St. Louis, Missouri. Mm-hmm. So we stopped in East St. Louis. They had a DraftKings casino there, that uh, we, DraftKings Sportsbook Casino. It was actually pretty cool. We got to check that out. We went to a St. Louis Cardinals game. That was a really cool experience. East St. Louis, again, another place that you shouldn't be walking around at night. The locals there, after the cards game, they told us, okay, which one is your subway stop? That one, okay, do not go a subway further. Do not go a subway further after that. You better stay to where you are. So, again, good learning experience. So that was was St. Louis. Then we made our way to Kansas. Kansas is an interesting spot. That uh, I remember going to have lunch at this place called – Oh shit. I remember, I forget the name. The, um, oh, oh, the guys watching this are going to kill me. Uh, I'll I'll come back to it. Uh, Anyways, very interesting spot, Kansas, but we went to the Kansas, the Heartland Motor Speedway. Okay. For for race night in America. So our goal was to, 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 because we were doing content the entire way down, we wanted to get the Betmobile on the track because we heard you could do that and just fire it down the track and take some TikToks or whatever. They wouldn't let us do that. Uh, the bluff is the place that it's called. There we the go. Bluff. To me. The bluff. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, no, it, race night in America is basically anyone can go to the track. You just got to sign up, sign a waiver, and you can take your automobile and rip it around the course. So that, that was pretty cool to see, right? There wasn't a whole ton of people there, but again, just completely different environment than what we're used to. And then we made our way to uh, Blackhawk, Colorado. So have you guys ever been there, Blackhawk? I've I've been to Denver, but I've not been to okay. Blackhawk. And you've been to so, Denver as well, not, I believe. Yeah, I haven't been there. Okay. Yeah. So Blackhawk, Colorado is essentially a mini Vegas. 
That's why we stopped there. We spent the weekend there. They have all kinds of sports books. I think there's like nine, like Colorado's big for sports betting, but these guys have brick and mortar places that you can play at the kiosks. That was super cool. Like literally Blackhawk, I think the population of Blackhawk is like 75 people. Like it's, it's literally that small. It's a place carved out in the middle of the Rockies. So the scenery is absolutely stunning. And we got to bet at uh, places like Barstool and FanDuel. And it, it, basically everyone was there. Monarch Monarch has an independent line code of a lot of sports books that are on the Don Best board. So that was pretty cool. That was something that we wanted to check out. That's where we actually, it was, uh, was it draft. Yeah, it was DraftKings. We actually got banned from playing the... <laughs> The fucking kiosk. We were there for three days and we had a manager came up to us and told us to stop betting at the kiosk. If you want to play any fucking any any plays, you come to the key, you come to the, the counter. counter. We don't yeah. Yeah. So that that was interesting. Like again, we're we're used to this shit, right? It's a constant cat and mouse game when you know what you're doing in sports betting. But that was that was pretty unique being like literally there for three days. So Anyways, I, I highly recommend Blackhawk, Colorado. It's in the middle of nowhere, but it, it's, it's a really nice town. Really, really, again, the scene, scenery was incredible. A lot of good opportunity there if you're sports better. Next stop was Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. Uh, that was the uh, Albuquerque Isotopes game. Oh, we went to a Rockies game too in Denver, so that was pretty cool. My, uh, Coors Field. Coors Field, yeah. yeah. You know, and then obviously we bet the under. We're like, who bets the under? <laughs> the Rockies. Coors Field. Yeah, and we... <laughs> We like it was looking great out of the gate, but you know how it can get in that. Sure, stadium. he probably had like yeah. an eight run inning or something like yeah, that. That's yeah, that's exactly what they, in the eighth inning they had an eight run <laughs> inning. So yeah, that that was kind of annoying. But uh, yeah, then Albuquerque, we went and watched the Albuquerque Isotopes play another Triple A baseball game. Cool experience. And then I'm a big Breaking Bad fan, so I yeah. went to around Albuquerque to all the Breaking Bad um, movie locations or I guess so. filming locations, and they all exist. So, you know, we got to go by Walter's, Walter White's house. We went to the car wash. We went to the nail salon that uh, Better Call Saul. Better Call Saul is another one that yeah. filmed everything in New Mexico. Los Pollos Hermanos. Yeah, did you go uh, yeah. Yes. Polo Hermanos? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we went to all those spots. It was super cool. Got pictures with the Batmobile. Awesome experience. And then that was that. That was, uh, I think it was in total, a 10-day journey. We finally pulled into Vegas. Uh, it, it was a great feeling. Uh, I think I had slept in, yeah, I think it was 11 total beds in 12 days or something like that. It was wild, just absolutely wild. Pulled into Vegas. We did a Raiders um, Patriots preseason game. So we got to see Allegiant Stadium for the first time, which was a fantastic experience. I, I missed you. I missed you then that we, I was in, in Vegas that same week, that week. Oh, really? I should have hit you up, but I didn't even oh, really yeah. know. But yeah, I was there for the Patriots Raiders. Uh, okay. I didn't nice. go to the yeah. I didn't go to the game. I was I was planning on going to the game, and uh, things got out of hand a little earlier. Lost too the much day. money. <laughs> things got a little bit. You know, I, I yeah. When you're at you know when you can go to the pool and 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 drink all day, then the the football becomes an afterthought after a while. I, absolutely, Vegas is dangerous like that. That's the one thing that I've learned out here is that you need an extraordinary amount of discipline to you know stay focused and do the betting that I have to do, but. Man, things can get out of can get out of hand real fast. Like you know, just just the other night, uh, I go to the Bellagio for a Monday night football game, and it's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to take it easy tonight. I'm not drinking. And then you're sitting there. I'm like, oh fuck, I got to drink something. Like, I, I, I get a seltzer. We'll take it easy. You know, just a seltzer. And then you take a seltzer. Boom, that goes down real nice. And then all of a sudden, uh, I'm surrounded by a group from uh, Boston. The Patriots were in town for the regular season. And they're, oh, come on, you got to have a drink with us. I'm like, okay, on to the Negroni. I get a Negroni in me and then finish the Negroni. And, you know, they take off, they have dinner reservations, thank God. And then sitting there, then a group from Seattle shows up. And they're like, oh, you got to have a shot with us. I'm like, Christ, okay, now I have a shot. And then, you know, you got to get another drink. And the game's, you know, halfway through the game. So that's the thing. I went there with the intention of just having a quiet night to watch the game. And it turns into a fucking shit show just out of thin air like that. So that's Vegas. <laughs> that is, uh, that is Vegas. Um, again, you can follow Pisky at Banfield Group, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. We will definitely play that TikTok clip, the one we were referring to earlier in the show, because I, I went through all the TikToks, and I do follow you guys, and that one uh, that one cracked me up so quite a bit. edit it in post yeah. if you can, Zach, for the, for the uh, listeners here. Or if you want to see it, just check out the YouTube. 
Um, and then obviously, I, go ahead I got one more thing. The, the challenge with ben, with sports, this is a, a personal story. I've had the exact same dream as you when you were younger, right? I want to work for a sports team. Like this is, I, I live and breathe sports. I'm a numbers guy. Like, and then I, I went for an interview as like, the, I won't say the organization, but like the director of analytics for an, a, a, a professional sports team. And you would imagine that that would come with a certain salary. And then you get to the salary discussion and it's like, doesn't even come close to that because there's yeah. people lining up for that job, right? Like yeah. they literally cannot, they're going through stacks of thousands of resumes for a job like that. So that once I realized there's no money in sports until you make it to like, you know, GM. Yeah. Then it's yeah. like, uh, I'd, I'd rather, I'll keep the bet. Speaking of money, Piske, I got to ask you this. It was not on the notes, so we'll surprise you with this. If you listen to, um, you know, a few previous episodes, we've asked guests this in the past. The question is the billion dollar flip, otherwise known as the Billy dollar flip. So, the, so basically, if you were presented an opportunity where you could flip a coin, regular coin, heads, tails, um, if you call it correct, you win a billion dollars. One billion. All right. Okay. At what amount would you like sell that flip to sell that opportunity to somebody else for? So obviously expected value on that 500 million. You get a billion. If you win it, you lose it. Zero dollars. You walk away home. What amount would you cash out at? Oh, that's uh, a, <laughs> that's a tough, that's a question for the full dog. No, he's the math guy, not me. Well, if we have um, him on one day, just, we'll ask so him just as well. So just like think about it from this perspective. If I came up to you and said, I'll give you $200 million uh, right now and you're no longer flipping that coin like do you take that or do you flip it anyways like it, it, it's but here, we've so gotten very very different answers just so you can gauge the question if i had asked you right now then i like let's say i just actually offer you this all right hundred dollar bet flip a coin me versus you hundred dollar bet not a big deal whatever let's go mm -hmm. you're probably if i say I, i'll i won't we won't bet but um you know, pay me, I'll pay you, I'll pay you $47. You're not going to take that, right? Because it's $3 less than expected value. This is a hundred bucks. You probably don't care about it. So you're like, okay, why would I take that bet? I, I'll take 51 maybe, right? But I'm not, I might not take 47. So in that scenario, it's easy to see. But when you're at the billion dollar range, that's what we're trying to get here. It's a really good question to gauge kind of like risk tolerance, stuff like that. And it's cool because you've already, you know, you've cashed out on something. So it's, it's curious to see uh, your opinion on that. Well, what's the cash I out number? I, I, yeah, I am super conservative, so I am very risk intolerant. Mm -hmm. The risk guy, again, is my partner. Uh, so I would, I would say, and I, I know the math people are going to kill me for it, but yeah, if you offered me, uh, would you say 407, 470 million? I, I'd say if in a heartbeat, and I, because you have the risk of losing it if it goes the opposite way, right? Yeah, but what's the lowest you would take? Oh, what's the lowest I would take? Yeah, like what's the lowest amount that you'd be like, all right, I'll still cash out for this? What's it, what's it cost to run a sports book these days? How, how much mm. to buy a sports book? Well, <laughs> to, run, on the to book. buy, to, to buy, buy one yeah. could be anywhere between $1 and, uh, I think WinBet was asking 500 million, but, uh, Oof. it doesn't, doesn't look like they got it. Um, probably be better off starting your own at that point. Yeah. I think like the startup cost for a book is probably in like the 10 to $20 million range. I would guess. Uh, depends okay. how hard you got to go on marketing. True. It depends on what your marketing budget is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Christ. <laughs> I mean, the lowest I would go. I actually, I actually don't know. I, I would say, um, call it, call it a hundred million. Okay. Is that crazy? No, no, man, it's no. not at all. We've got, I said up, way though, lower than up. that personally. So, so if I offered you 99 mil, you're not taking that. <laughs> this is where it gets tricky, right? It's a great question. Yeah. Oh man. I, uh, Again, there, there is there is a mathematical formula in this, and I'm sure the full dog is going to be watching this and just shaking his head at me. No, but but it doesn't um, matter. But, like I, I'm a math guy, right? But I'm in yeah. I'm in your boat as well. Like for me, I, I don't. And it, it personal situations matter for people. Like I don't have kids, right? I don't have to leave money behind to my kids or my grandkids. I just need enough to comfortably do whatever I want for the rest of my life, and that's right. the amount that I would take. I don't have to be greedy or anything like that. So anything like 10 to 20 million, boom, I would, I would forego the, the, the flip right there. Yeah. Yeah. Like I say, yeah. Am I going to say no to 10 million? No, I wouldn't say no to 10 million. Like, yeah. So but yeah, you, you wouldn't keep say no cutting to 10 me down. million on the way down. for a, on the chance for a 500, for a billion dollars. But when you, but when you're like, when you're conservative, 
like Pisky or myself, you, you, I, I can't even explain how how easily and quick I would say no to ten million. Sure, I know, but you, but like you, you have no problem working and grinding hard for like ten million dollars, right? Like you, you that that's p- fine to each their own. I'm beat down, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. like if you give me ten million and I don't have to work for that anymore, like boom, I'm taking that. I'm, I'll ride oh, off wow. into the sunset. You know, play buy a few places around the world, travel, and like that's my life. Fair Absolutely. I, I, I'm the same way too. So um, it, honestly, if I got a question like this, the first person I would call would be the full dog and say, what do I do? Because, and I'll give you guys an example. Did you guys hear the mad dog story about the circus survivor? Yeah, we did. So, I, I was okay. following that in real time. I was like, cause, really? I, cause I had the Steelers that night in that game. Okay. I'm like, man, like imagine the mental state you're in watching that game. Oh my goodness. Uh, like crazy. So Absolutely for those crazy. who don't know, this was the Circa Survivor Pool. We had Derek Stevens on the podcast earlier before the year. He talked all about it. You can find the rules and everything back in that podcast sack link in the description. But basically, this guy, there was four people left. He had already survived. And there was three people that had the Steelers left in the night game versus the Raiders. So Christmas if, Eve. On Christmas Eve. So if the Raiders have win that game, now as we mentioned, the Steelers won. If the Raiders win that game, that guy goes home, six million unsplit pot. It's all his. What happened was Raiders end up losing that game in the final minute. Kenny Pickett fourth and one uh, converts it. So if he doesn't convert that one play, this guy goes home six million USD cold hard cash. Instead, you have to pick another game for Christmas Day. I think he took the Dolphins. They lost. Yeah. And he's the only guy eliminated. The other three who had the Steelers took other teams and advanced. So now it still goes on. Honestly, a a very tough. That's, I feel you feel for the it, guy. It's, that's just one. I think there's two guys. There's a partnership, but yeah, you feel for that because to be so <sighs> close on that, like that's a massive swing on one play. Like just even watching that. Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, go ahead. So yeah, so high to so low, but uh, the full dog brought this to my attention, and uh, he already had like if it happened to us, he already had like a crazy ass. Uh, hedge system worked out right like well you would put 2.1 million here and you do this there and you do that there and you could even hedge in the next game going to and i'm like okay okay so yeah a question like that is how do you get the 2.1 down exactly that's the and he only had a few hours exactly yeah exactly uh you fuck we we joked about it too he's like i think i could have done pretty good but you know we, we have some pretty solid connections in the offshore industry and stuff like that but yeah, it, it would have been it would have been very very difficult. And you're just max betting everywhere you can. You're talking to other groups. You know what I mean. You're sending out massive whatever you can get me on this game. You got to get down on it. And again, you only what did he have? Like maybe three hours to do it. Yeah, but on top, like the issue is moving money around too. Like you know, Pinnacle will take hundred k a pop at that time, like before the game. Circa will do that as well, right? You have an offshore that'll do that. But it's like you got to get the money into the book. Well, as the well, only right? hope is like, you, you, have, yeah. you would have to get a marker at Circa, yeah. and then they would have had to give you a, like a two million dollar marker as like, okay, this is my marker. If I if, if I lose this bet, it's coming out of my winnings, and like potentially that that would have probably been the only way you can actually get two point one mil down at any respectable number. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, without mm-hmm. leveraging because you have so many complications if you're betting on credit, yeah. and even if you're tapping in, it's like, well, do you have two point one mil liquid to pay that out if it loses? Because Circa is not going to not going to pay out for a couple of weeks on that probably. Right. Yeah. And then it's like, how do you get that money to those guys? They're not going to, maybe they don't want to settle in us. Yeah. Dollar. Like, so, so it actually is very hard to do. Oh yeah. But yeah. And uh, I, what would have been crazy. I think you just go into the mode of that, of that point of just like, I'm going to get as much, as much as, as you can possible down yeah. on the, uh, as a hedge. Like realistically, I'm going to, you know, I'll call up every contact I have, get me whatever you can. Um, yeah, will be crazy as well. The Steelers were favored in the game, right? So you would have to bet the Steelers. Yeah. But if you, in some capacity, bet the Steelers money line, then are you now? Let's say you got two point one Steelers money line. You're now rooting for the Steelers to win because you get that two point one yeah. guaranteed, and, he, and then you're still it, in the expected value. Exactly. Right? So you're kind of like almost. It's crazy. It is. Yeah, that's exactly how or you're, you're it rooting for the Steelers to tie oh, the game that tie because the tie. In the uh, in circa survival. eliminates everyone, so you push yeah. you push your two point one mil, take the yes. six. Wow, love doing this, yeah. man. We all. So there you go. You money. you just did the math really quick, but <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what was thrown at me. And then 
you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that would be cool. Hey, hey, listen, any way you cut it, it would be a pretty cool problem to have. Yeah. And it would make for one hell of a story. That's for sure. Like I had to bet $2.1 million in three hours and this is how I did it. <laughs> yep. We always talk around the office here of like, we should develop a tool that when you, obviously we have our incredible bet tracking software uh, through BetStamp, but it was kind of like, if you, it should, it should tell you what result you're cheering for on this play as a result of all your bets. Because especially when you, everyone has like fantasy teams, different prop bets, different stuff. And then sometimes you might have like, maybe you have the over and the under at different numbers and stuff like that. You Maybe you're rooting for a middle. So I always, always, yeah. we always laugh here. Like it should tell you like, all right, here's what you, you're rooting for here. Field goal or you're like, you need a touchdown, missed extra point. Then you need this guy to not get yards and then them to convert this and get go for two and win it. And then that's how you win all your bets. Like I would love it yeah. if it had that for you. I, I can't tell you guys how many times the full dog and I went back and forth during last year's product uh, project uh, about exact same scenarios because they were kind of two different entities, right? We needed something with the ticket project, but the full dog bets like an animal on the other side as well, right? He's going after live betting. He's going after half times, props, all that shit. So we treated them as two separate. So yeah, sometimes, you know, you're cheering for one thing on the ticket side, but you also need something else on the traditional betting side. And yeah, there's all kinds of different scenarios. And then you can even throw in our useless fantasy league that, uh, you know, it causes stress for no reason. And, and yeah. You're like, I, I need a Bills touchdown here, but it can't be Diggs, Singletary, or like three guys. <laughs> and then you're like, let's go. And then you're just rooting, staring at the screen. Yeah. The exactly. one, the so one I thing I, I, rem- I don't play uh, season-long fantasy football anymore because I, I personally just think it's a waste of yeah. time. But the pride is so damn important that there would oh. be times where I would cheering be cheering against a significant bet for mm-hmm. one of my players to score a touchdown because I would rather lose like 5K than have my friends rub it in my face. Yeah, I, I recently heard uh, Dave Portnoy complaining about the same thing, right? He's like, I got like 100 grand on this game. But meanwhile, deep down inside, it, fantasy's fucking me up because of my stupid $300 league. Yeah. Because, yeah, you don't want to hear it from the other guys in your league, right? Same thing on our end. Uh, the fucking fantasy league that we created. Oh, my goodness. And and by we, I mean the godfather. And I, the full dog doesn't fuck with fantasy. He's like, no, he says what you say. The waste of time. So. You guys are smart. We're idiots. Oh no! I, but I, I, Johnny got, loves fantasy. You tell I play yeah. fantasy. I come in every single. I come into the office. It was not my year this year. I'll go. I'll, I'll give a shit. I knew it wasn't his year, by the way, because when I came into the office, he's very quiet for like these last eight weeks. That normally I come in, he'd be like, "Oh, you see the game that this guy had? I scooped him off the waiver wire. This and that. You know, this was yeah. very quiet this year." Jonathan right. I, did me dirty this I time. was mute as well. I actually like stopped watching football at certain points because what we created is, I think it's the craziest fantasy football league on the planet. We have relegation. So if you finish in the bottom two of the top league, you go down to the B league. I and love if you that. finish you in the bottom quit, two. You, there's no way I'm playing in the No, B but you got to work your way back up, man. No chance. You got you to you uh, restore. No chance. If I got relegated to a lower tier league, I'm out. I'm out of fantasy. Uh, there's no way. <laughs> that's that's exactly what the Godfather says. He hasn't had to deal with relegation yet, and he says that Pisky, if I fucking if that if I go near that, I'll you'll never see me again. I'm not playing this stupid game. But yeah, we got a big ass trophy. It's called the Jungle Bowl. There's three leagues. There's three divisions. So if you lose in the B League, you go down to the C League, and that's beyond embarrassing. Serie C, Serie C, and then Italian soccer. Yeah, and and so to yes to to go on to your point. Uh, I embarrassingly got relegated this year. I'm going down to the B League next year. And uh, yeah, that's it. Fantasy sucks. That happens. All right. So Waste I guess we'll, we'll close off with our final question here. We've asked, it to, we've asked it to all our guests on this podcast. Pisky, thank you for coming on. It was a great, great interview. One of, uh, one of my favorites definitely so far. So our closing question is, if you could go back five years, this would be back when you were still working at the OLG here in Ontario. Uh, what would be the one piece of advice that you would give to your former self? Well, I think it would be uh, buy Bitcoin. Oh, you guys hate that. <laughs> <laughs> don't you? Yeah. That, so he has <laughs> listened to him. Yes, <laughs> we, we, we're, we're not fans of that answer. Uh, I know. Well, I know. I, at bulldog. this point, I think you might be underwater now. Is the it full- <laughs> from five? So no, five years I, ago, Jan, let's go Jan January 3, 2018. Oh, would you? 2018. No, I, yeah, you're under, man. Uh, I, I don't actually. You're slightly under. Oh, are you? I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't uh, this even... is my prediction. I think you're slightly under. 
Uh, Five years ago would have been 2017, right? Jan- 2018. January 2018. Mm, uh, I'm not sure. Jan- but no, I, I'm 2018, just... Bitcoin price was 17500 it appears. Oh, you're basically at par, more or less. No, yeah. I'm, I'm just fucking around. The, the full dog gave me a heads up months ago, Rob, when we were talking in the summer about doing something like this. He's like, when they ask you the question, make sure you don't say something stupid, like <laughs> buy Bitcoin, because they're going to chew you out and uh, they, they don't like shit like that. No, so, yeah, no, no I, I'm this just is a great around. interview. We really appreciate it. But yeah, what would, what yeah. would the advice be? I'm what, curious to know. Okay, so um, this whole social media thing that I started uh, was just something I've had deep down inside me that has needed to come out. I've always had a passion for like public speaking and connecting with people and stuff. And you guys know being in the sports betting industry can be very like, uh, I don't want to say lonely, but it's a solo mission, right? You're in front of the screen with Don Best and, and like, it's very quiet. And that, that is something that is kind of, and even working at the lottery corporation, we're in a very small office with a very small amount of people cordoned off because we have TVs everywhere. So they had to corner basically like quarantine us. So I've always had this desire to get out there and put myself out there. And this social media thing is really something that I needed and I'm going to keep pressing in this direction. So my advice to myself would be get started, get started five years ago. uh, Because, you know, it's a grind, right? You guys are involved, you know, you understand what the social media game is and building a following. It's a fucking grind and a half. So, and it takes time, right? And it takes time getting used to stuff, getting comfortable in front of the camera and speaking. So my advice would be, I, I wish I would have started about five years earlier, just little things. Like it could be anything, right? I knew I had a passion for it, but I was you know, still quite shy and wasn't quite ready, but I wish I was. And that's what I would have told my, uh, so five years ago. Fair enough. So I guess more just like, you know, Get out there a little more for anyone uh, anyone listening. If you've had the urge to do it, uh, you might as well do it. I think that's yeah. pretty solid advice. Yeah, you, you, you got to take your shot because as far as we know, you know, you get one kick at this can, at this thing called life. And, you know, if there's something deep down inside that you want to do, sure, it's going to be scary. Sure, nobody likes to fail, but failing is not failing. Failing is learning. So you got to... You got to go after it. And, uh, you know, when you do it, it, it really feels good. And it's an adventure. And uh, I'm glad I'm doing it now. And, uh, yeah, we keep pressing forward. That's Pisky of the Banfield Group, at Banfield Group on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. He is part of the Always Betting Podcast. Be sure to check that out. You can also check out the website, banfieldgroup.com. If you enjoyed this interview today, smash that like button. Consider subscribing to the Circles Off channel as well as we do have more and more of this content planned over the coming months. Pisky, thank you very much for your time. It was good to catch up with you. This has been episode number 83 of Circles Off on the Hammer Betting Network. 